Welcome to David's Ships. In this video, I continue with the construction of the 1 and 350 scale HMS hood model. To watch other videos in this build series, follow the link to the playlist in the cards above. Today I'll be cleaning up the seam line between the upper and lower hull. I stuck these two parts together about a week ago and I've been waiting for the glue to dry. The glue that I used, the Tamiya extra thin plastic cement, has taken a very long time to dry. Yet another reason not to use this glue, I'd rather use Revell Contactor Professional. To fill the seam, I'm using Tamiya plastic putty. This is a new tube of putty, so this is the consistency that it's supposed to be. In the previous video, you saw what it looks like when it's very stale. But even though this is a lot thinner than in that previous video, it still needs to be thinned more because I want to apply it quite precisely to the seam line. I don't want to put down too much of this plastic putty because then you spend a lot of time sanding it off and trying to get back down to what is actually really a small amount that you need on the model. So the method I prefer to take is to thin it out and then build it up in layers over time. To thin the plastic putty, I use Tamiya lacquer thinners. I suppose any lacquer thinner will do. That seems to be the solvent for this putty. I thin it into a runny paste that I can then apply to the model with a paintbrush. It's almost like painting on a very thick paint. When applying this very thinned out putty, it looks quite raised. It is quite raised, in, in fact. But as the solvent evaporates off, it's going to flatten out. And it might actually even be necessary to put on multiple rounds of this putty to actually have it such that you can sand it to be flat. But I don't think that is much of a concern because it's very easy to apply the putty this way. I think it's easier to apply a little bit of putty that's thin rather than trying to remove a lot of thick putty. The difficulty with removing a lot of putty is that you need to try and avoid all the details that are around it. Fortunately on the hull there is not a lot of detail. There is this little bit of molding for the armor belt that runs just above the waterline. But you still don't want to damage detail, and if you are sanding a lot in an area, there is a greater risk of removing detail that you don't want to remove. It's a bit hard to see in the video, but the problem here is that the red lower part of the hull is stepped in from the grey upper section of the hull, so I'm trying to remove that step. If you look at photos of the ship and other drawings, you can see that there shouldn't be a step on that line at all. It should be completely smooth. So that is why I'm focusing on putting the putty below the gray and onto the red portion of the hull. So I want to fill up that gap so that it can be smoothed down without having to remove too much of the plastic. It's far easier to sand the plastic putty than it is to sand plastic. Another thing to note about plastic putty is that it has a solvent in it that will eat into the plastic of the model itself. And that's actually a good thing because it means that when you sand it down, even the slightest bit of putty that needs to sit on the model will stick. You can sand it to being perfectly smooth. You don't have to worry about it flaking off and falling off because the putty has gone and eaten itself into the plastic to create a very strong bond. So even though this is very thinned out putty, I'm not concerned about it falling off or flaking off at a later point. I know it is going to bond in strongly and it's not going to fall off when I try and sand it and that I will be able to create a nice smooth finish. After putting a couple layers of putty on the seam line and then letting it stand for around a day to dry, it is then ready to be sanded. Before I start sanding, I cover the upper section of the hull with masking tape. This is to cover the details so that if I do accidentally slip or go over the line, and I do drag a sanding sponge across the upper section of the hull, the details are protected by this masking tape. Masking tape is more important for covering the details that are close to the waterline. It's mostly for that section of belt armor that has that small step in it. Even if the masking tape wasn't there, I don't think I'd remove it too quickly, but I do want to just protect that area and try and limit the amount of plastic that gets removed accidentally. After covering the upper section of the hull, I'm ready to start sanding. I only use three grit levels for sanding. I start with the 240 grit sanding sponge. This removes a lot of the plastic putty very quickly. When I'm finished with this round of sanding, I want that to feel smooth to the touch. I don't want to be able to feel any raised edges. The problem with using a 240 grit sanding sponge is that it is very rough and that it will impart a lot of scratches onto the plastic that will be visible after painting. 
So after getting the seam line into the general shape that I want, I then need to step down into finer grits of sandpaper to smooth out those scratches and make the surface ready for painting. After the 240 grit sanding sponge, I move on to a 400 grit sanding sponge. I use this sponge to remove the scratches left behind by the 240 grit sanding sponge. After sanding the model with this sponge, the surface is still quite rough and not really ready for painting either. So I then move on to a 1000 grit sanding sponge. This almost puts a little bit of a sheen on the kit and makes it very nice and smooth. And I find that this is an appropriate level on which to paint. You don't need to go below this. You can get sanding sponges to over 2000 grit, but I think 1000 grit sanding sponge for an area that you're going to cover with paint is more than sufficient. This is a bit of an iterative process. After sanding everything down and checking the seam lines, there might be defects that you see that would then require you to fill those areas with more putty and then sand that area again. Also find that in some areas you can still see scratches from the 240 grit sandpaper, in which case you need to give it more attention with the 400 grit sanding paper to remove the scratches, and then again with the 1000 grit sanding paper to smooth out that finish so that it's ready for painting. As you can see, during this process, the hull is handled quite roughly. This isn't a gentle process. You grabbing it and manhandling it and bending it and flipping it upside down, which is why I always say I'm incredibly surprised that manufacturers like Trumpeter put gluing the upper and lower section of the hull together as the last step. It makes absolutely no sense at all. There's absolutely no way that you could do this work with the superstructure fully installed on the upper hull. It just wouldn't work. You'd, you'd break it. Obviously, you'd break it. So I, I really don't understand why they say, choose if you want upper or lower hull on the very last stage of the instruction manual. Surely, it should be the first step. You do this first. Once this is done, you then have a solid base onto which you can build. After sanding out the seam line and being happy with the condition of the joint between the upper and lower hull, I'm ready to glue the deck onto the upper hull. Since gluing the upper and lower sections of the hull together with extra thin plastic cement didn't work so well, I'm moving back to Revell Contactor Professional. That's what's in this jar. I just found that the bottle that Revell Contactor Professional comes in is hopeless and continuously gets clogged up and broken. So I decant them into an old paint jar and rather apply it with a paintbrush. This is a bit of a messy process, and I do put on probably too much glue. That was partially why I was looking at using extra thin glue, because I wanted to be more precise with its application. But the reality is, in a similar vein to the seam, it actually doesn't matter, because this excess glue is going to be inside the hole. Nobody's ever going to see it. You won't even have to deal with cleaning it up. Even if some of the glue did come out onto the top of the deck, even then, I don't care because I've got a wooden deck that's going to be placed on top of this. What I really want here is for the deck pieces to be strongly bonded to the hull so that this part doesn't fall apart later on in the build. After applying the glue to the bow, I then put down the forward section of decking. There is a slight curve to the hull. It's very slight on this ship, much less so than most of the other ships that I've built. That does make it a little bit easier to stick down these pieces. Obviously, if they don't have to bend, it makes things a little bit easier. And I find that the deck pieces actually fit this hull very well. Often I find myself needing to put jugs of water and paint and books and all sorts of things on top of the deck to hold it in place. But since this fit is so good, I'm able to just hold it down with strips of masking tape. After gluing the bow section, I then move on to the mid section following the same process. Once again, the fit is very good. It almost sits perfectly without the need for any straps, but nevertheless, I still do want to hold it down just to make sure that there isn't any part of the deck that isn't in proper contact with the hull. So I strap it down as well. And then I give some attention to the B barbette. In this case, I apply the glue to the inside of the barbette to glue it to the forward section of deck. Since this is going inside in a place that it will not be seen, I just slap it on with a paintbrush. It's quite difficult to get in there, but I think it's better to apply the glue from the inside. That way you won't make such a mess on the outside or risk getting glue on the side of the barbette, which won't be concealed by a wooden deck. 
and also being at a corner makes it a little bit more difficult to sand, especially with details being around it. Don't want to accidentally damage fine detail on the side of the barbette or on the deck itself. So if I can apply glue in such a way that I'm not going to need to remove it by sanding, then that's the method that I will follow. Since this barbette also sits in contact with the forward section of decking, and that's what I'm trying to glue to it, I then use masking tape to clamp it down so that it's in good contact with both sections of deck. After installing the midsection of deck, I then install the aft section of deck. Well, I believe this is actually the quarter deck. The quarter deck being a step down section of decking fits within its own area. It doesn't have to be coordinated with any other sections of deck. And fortunately, once again, this part fits in rather well. So far, I've been quite happy with the fit for this kit. As with the other sections of deck, despite its good fit, I still tape it down to ensure that there is good contact between the deck and the upper hull. Looking at the forward section of deck, I do see some gaps between the side of the hull and the deck itself. So I'm gonna start trying to fill those with a bit of glue. Once again, I'm using extra thin plastic cement here. It's not exactly the best gap filling medium, but I think if I can get some glue in there and then push it down with a pen or something to raise up the masking tape so I can get a bit of leverage on it, I think that will help the situation and will assist with closing that gap. There's also a bit of a gap between the forward and mid sections. I'm not too concerned about that because a piece of wooden deck is going to cover that area, but I do want them to be aligned with each other, at least on the same level. So I use some toothpicks to construct a brace to hold them at the same height. After letting the glue dry for around a day, I can then remove the masking tape and flip over the model to work on this rather large seam line for the lower hull. This is another minor detail to deal with. Although this is a big and ugly seam, it is underneath the hull and it will not be seen. Once you've constructed a ship, you're not going to be turning it over. So I could excuse people for not removing it, but I will know it's there, so it needs to go. And removing a seam line on smooth plastic like this is very easy, so might as well do it while well, I can do it easily with the ship in this state. Step one is to remove as much of the seam line as possible using a file. This really does scratch up the hull a lot, but that can easily be corrected with sandpaper. The process that I follow is much the same as it was for the seam line. After filing off the seam line, I then use a 240 grit sandpaper to smooth it out as much as possible. This removes the larger scratches left by the file. Then after the 240 grit sandpaper and its scratches, I then re-sand with a 400 grit sandpaper, which removes the worst of the scratches. And then again with a 1000 grit sanding paper to create a nice smooth finish that is ready for paint. And that is it for this video. In the next video, I'll be installing a upgraded degaussing cable that will involve removing the existing plastic molded degaussing cable and then replacing it following the advice of the HMS Hood Association. If you would like to support this channel or see how this model looks when it is eventually completed, then please subscribe. Thanks for watching. Cheers.